again, I definitely want to, you know, sure you've heard it all day long, but thank you guys for spending your time coming out, um, checking out what we have going on. Definitely appreciate it. You know, we're, we're a golf course group now, so I assume a lot of you guys are superintendents, superintendents. Um, okay. Um, but either way, taking time away from your companies, from your golf courses, we definitely appreciate it. This is what you see around us. This is your guys' money at work. You know, we're, we're funded by the generous donations that we get from the industry. So we're trying to do what we think is some real applicable stuff, but I definitely want you guys to pull one of us aside and let us know if there's something that you see throughout the day that we should be doing or we could do better or um, maybe we shouldn't be doing so. I have a whole lot of stuff I'm going to talk about in a very short period of time. I'm probably not going to get to all of it, but the good thing is you get me right next door, so we can we got a little bit of time. We have about 24 minutes total to get both of them done. So um, let me just introduce Leah. Does everyone know Dr. Leah Broman? I want to thank Leah right off the bat. She's also on my graduate committee. This is my graduate project. Um, but what we did here, as a superintendent, when I came on board, we came on board in April. So good time to start grass in, in the spring in Pacific Northwest? No. Yep. Unless, unless you want to start annual bluegrass. This year was <laughs> a great spring for establishing annual bluegrass. Um, but because I was here in the spring, we wanted to do get something going so we had some field work under our belt. So we, what we decided, um, being a golf course superintendent, the particular facility I was at most recently was a real, um, the golf course was designed to be little to no environmental impact. The whole golf course drained to itself. It was colonial bank grass, fine fescue, fairways and tees, velvet bank grass greens. Um, ha so I had some real good exposure to basically not watering turf grass and being able to provide a good stand. Um, so what we're trying to focus on is to minimize our inputs, um, to help you guys as the end user put out a better product, if we can, um, with a whole lot less input. Um, David Phipps, for you guys who don't know David, sit on the same program, definitely up in Stone Creek. I'm not sure I don't know of anyone else's facilities, but nonetheless. So what we did, like I said, we established this in spring. We've got all 10 cool season turf grasses most commonly used throughout the Pacific Northwest, throughout the whole C3 region in the United States for that matter, right? Um, we've got one of them one of them represented with the signage. The other two blocks, same grasses, just different orders. Um, and then if you look, we obviously have two different mowing heights, right? We wanted to represent fairway application, T application, um, maybe a little bit too low of a mowing height for an athletic field, um, you know, grass, grass tennis courts, bowling courts, whatever. Five ace, the higher height of cut, two inches. Um, home lawn with some kind of inputs. You know, large industry complex, any, any kind of large turf grass that's going to receive some kind of input. Park setting, you know, you guys, you, you name it. You guys are growing it more than we are. Um, so with that being said, I just wanted to point this out. This is the mower that we were using to establish those two heights. If you look on the bottom side of it, it's got a roller. So it does a really good job striping. Um, the reason I chose to use this is because we can do this. Bam. Five eighths of an inch. Bam. Two inches of a height of cut. When the guys are mowing nothing to it. They can switch their height of cut if they need to. Um, shorter height of cut, mowed Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two inch on Tuesdays. So once a week, three times a week. Along with our mowing treatments, we've also got fertility treatments going this way. So as you guys are walking around the box, you can almost still see some of the, the, the applications of our, our, our nitrogen treatments, but those are going this way, okay? So if you look at this plot, you know, we've got two different nitrogen levels. What those nitrogen levels are, one pound and four pounds. How many pounds are we removing when we collect clippings from turf grass annually of nitrogen? Anybody? One. One pound, right? So what we're trying to do with this one pound rate is to basically simulate zero to no inputs, right? Because we do have to remove the clippings. Adjacent plots to the bluegrass, especially if you're a fescue plot, annual bluegrass, we're going to have annual bluegrass encroachment. But what we wanted to do is eliminate any bank grass stolen, making it into another plot, just trying to eliminate all of our, our competition from plot to plot. Um, you know, the cool thing about this study is, you know, this is cool, I think, for you guys to be able to see all these different turf grasses in one spot under, under different applications and moisture. Um, so with the nitrogen, the half, the one pound receives 2.5 pound applications, Memorial Day and Labor Day, okay? The four pound is four one pound applications Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, Easter, okay? Being from the Midwest, we're not growing grass in, on Easter. Um, you guys, are, I can like to claim I'm, I'm now from the Northwest, but we're growing grass all year long, right? For the most part, so we threw in that Easter application of nitrogen. 
this being uh, a native soil, our soil test indicate we don't necessarily need any P and K. We didn't need any other any other nutrients. So nitrogen is our limiting nutrient. Okay. So established these in the spring last year. Established them in the spring this year. Got them growing for a game about 60 days to establish. Come July 15th, what happens around the first part of July to July 15th? The rain shuts off. Right. We don't have any irrigation, any or any precipitation, so to speak, of for about 45 days. What we plan on doing? Starting them for 45 days. We went until September 1st. We had zero. Last year we had three one hundredths of an inch of rain. This year we had one one hundredth of an inch of rain over that 45 days. So we're pretty confident we're going to be able to evaluate these and not have to worry about additional water inputs. If we did, we would have just made note of it. Okay. So what I did every day once we established the plots, July 15th, everything we deemed everything satisfactory. I made daily readings. Started right where Brian is. Walked east to west. Right. And look at each one of these individual subplots and what I deem basically to make a long story short I just asked myself and the other guys making the irrigation evaluations if they thought this particular subplot three by three could make it another day without water okay day away from dying type of thing um, and along with that we, we like to monitor you guys all know what glutation moisture is right everyone knows what glutation moisture is monitor our surface moisture if you look at like right here if you look on the very tip of that that's a little a little droplet of water called glutation moisture. It comes out of hydrothodes. Basically what it's telling you is that that plant has enough water where it's excreting excess water at night to get rid of it. So if we see glutation droplets on the, on the surface, we feel pretty comfortable that there's, there's enough water in there, okay? So when we ask ourselves, can we make it another day? If we deem it necessary to be irrigation, I have a little chart that's all 120 plots. We put a little W here, okay? And then you guys have all seen, may or may, or may not have all seen these glasses. You guys, who's seen the turf spy glasses? Oh. You guys can put them on the time roll. I put those on after I had already made my evaluations. And those are, what those do is they shrink down the, the spectrum of, of wave, wavelengths of light that we're looking at, okay? It's supposed to make the stressed out turf stand out a lot more. So what I want to do is see if I can see any type of additional stress that I could not see with my naked eye, okay? So make a long story short with those, I was able to see velvet bentgrass almost five days out versus the other stuff. Uh, perennial ryegrass was pretty tough and with everything else was kind of between, but it was an average of about 18 to 36 hours where we could detect it ahead of time. Being a superintendent, I don't think, I still consider my, I'm a certified superintendent, so I can say I, I'm still a superintendent. I would not want to wear those things on a daily basis. I, I tell people I go home and a nail in my forehead because I'd be so depressed because all you see is the stressed out turf. <laughs> but from, from an intern standpoint or someone that you're trying to get to understand stressed out turf, they'll see it. They're, they're a great application. Um, uh, blue blockers, everyone remember blue blockers? The guy in the roller skate? My blue blockers. That, I think that's all that probably technology is. It did full circle in 20 years. Um, so what we do when I deem it necessary to irrigate, I have a little contraption over here. I call it the BMIS, the Blanket Chip Mobile Irrigation System. Patent pending. Um, we've actually got a BMIS Plus that Ty's using this year. I feel pretty good about that. But what that does, when we're making our irrigation evaluations, I'm making those based on the fact that I'm going to replace, when I deem it ready for irrigation, three tenths of an inch of water. Okay. So if this particular plot goes four days and I give it three tenths of an inch, then we can figure out over that four days what X amount of ET that was. But basically, the intent was three tenths of an inch of water would not run off. The soil would take that three tenths. In that, it's 45 seconds for us to put down three tenths of an inch of water on each individual subplot. Okay, so that's why we chose that. We felt even if we had to do daily irrigation, three tenths probably would be a bit excessive. But the point was we weren't irrigating everything daily. We were stretching things out. The way it worked out, if you look at our weather station here, um, we had a percentage of ET annual bluegrass over the wall to wall required the most water. No big surprise, right? But it was still only 89 percent of our ET off our weather station. For that 45 day span okay and the tall fescue was down near 40 percent so we went anywhere from you know half and then in between um so did I, did I point out the moisture meter we're also making moisture meeting taking biometric water content readings in the morning and what i tried to do is i tried my first year to not really look at these numbers we take one reading from each plot but i wanted to try to see if we could at the end of the study correlate what i was seeing visually with the soil moisture yeah. so do you take the probes and then sample put put the same tines on and how deep your roots are going? Well, that, that's a great question. So what we initially wanted to do, we have two of these meters. I initially have a three inch and an eight inch. I 
had a meter with an eight-inch set of tines and a meter with a three-inch set of tines. But not not being the researcher that I that I wasn't at the time, I thought, okay, great, we'll start the study, we'll use these. We got about maybe three days into the trial last year, those eight-inch tines looked like pretzels. They were done. They ended up having to straighten them about every other plot, and then they ended up breaking. Fifty bucks a pop wasn't worth it. Three-inch tines were about another two days behind that, where I was doing the same thing. So these inch and a half tines is the only thing that we could find that I could find. It would work to go into these heavier soils once we started to dry things down. Keep in mind, from establishment, these things were irrigated at 100% ET until about two weeks before. We backed off to 80% ET, and then now they're on about 60. Well, they haven't been irrigated for two weeks with all the rain and whatnot, but we'll keep them anywhere between 40 and 60 from here on out. Um, so we, we take these readings. I download this information. So what I did with the inch and a half, which I thought would be kind of helpful if this is your only, only time that you can use, I went ahead and took all of our annual bluegrass, low nitrogen, low mowing height, and I took the average at the time of irrigation. So soil moisture, you know, I, these might have been, every time we irrigated, they were at 38%. Every time the perennial ryegrass was irrigated, it was maybe 20%. So we have those numbers. That was what we could really come up with for these. Um, so if you guys want, definitely can pass that around and play around with that. That's got some good, that's a good tool to have. You know, I want a lot of guys, you know, Superintendent-wise, I'm sure, are getting those and sending those out with their hand waterers so they have a, an idea of what they're looking at when they're putting their, those things, putting their, doing their hand watering. Um, so that's, that's TDR technology, time domain reflectometry technology. What that does is send an impulse, electronic impulse between those two times all the way down, and then it, just, it, takes, it determines how long it takes to go from time to time. That's your amount of moisture that, you know, that blocks that. So you, Todd, you found that a value for tool? I think so. And if, I, if I ever end up on a golf course again, I'll definitely have a couple of them. Yep. Um, so like I said, we're, we're going over here next, but I, you know, I still wouldn't mind maybe spending another minute or two here if you guys have some questions. Um, if you're the sand based green, you can use longer time. Right? Absolutely. I, I, yep. Yep. I talked to the guys. The guys at the University of Minnesota did a, a USGA green study with these, and he said about every month or so he was having to replace his 8 inch tines just because they were getting so warm from going into the sand all the time. But he was taking a number of readings a day, whereas you guys are just taking them up, popping them in here and there type of thing. Um, so result-wise, I'm not going to bore you with a whole lot of details, but there is a poster where you guys saw the, the beaverturf.com computer set up. I have a poster in there that's got, that explains the percentage of ET that each, each one of these plots ended up at. Make a long story short, we didn't see any kind of nitrogen effect last year. This year, like I said, I haven't ran the stats yet. Um, I think Leah well, yeah, might have been with nitrogen this year, which might screw everything up, but um, we didn't have a nitrogen effect One last year because we had things, you know, the spring we had, we had things pretty juiced up trying to get these things grown in in 60 days. Um, we did see a difference in mowing height. Um, anyone want to take a guess as to which one, high or low, more water? High. High. That's what I no didn't require more. I call it inputs, irrigation inputs. So the higher I think low water would or low mow height would need more water. Yep. 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 And I went into it thinking just the opposite.